So the real question I want to ask you is, it seems to me that the personal self and the mind, the personal mind, has really no access to that f the kind of knowing which the heart has. Mm. Allowing the heart to relax and open seems to open that door. It's a kind of portal into a, a deeper level of being. But I might be wrong, but I just, that's how it's been happening in me over the past few years. There aren't two selves. There isn't a real self and a false self, a higher self and a lower self, a paramatman and an atman. There is just the self, if we can call it a self, presence, being, consciousness, God in religious terms. The personal self, that's each of us, is an apparent limitation of that universal self. It seems to me that when we arrive in this world, we arrive packaged with our nervous systems. We have, like, it's the kind of package we... I, I remember you giving a wonderful example of a river flowing, and in the river there's little, little whirlpools. And the little whirlpools are, are inherited characteristics, are learnt characteristics after, we, when we're, after we're born. And so we live with, and within this nervous system, there is a sense of, as you say, there's a sense of separation. Yes, you, you, it would seem, even in an early stage, that an infant comes with a, a certain layer of conditioning attached to it. But the being, the essential being of the infant is, as you say, imminent. It is innermost. And the essential being of each of us now, our innermost being, is universal being, presence. So ultimately, there is no relationship between the individual self and the universal self, because there are not two selves there to be related to one another in the first place. There is just the self, just consciousness, just infinite being, and each of us are temporary limitations of that single universal being. Can the, the individual know presence? And the answer is no. If one, if one unveils or awakens to this presence and it moves, the, can't the, the, the awakening to that presence move and and transform the personal self. Absolutely, yes. So, it so, so there is a connection between the two. <laughs> <laughs> Only infinite being can recognize I am infinite being. So when we recognize it, what's called in the tradition, when we recognize our true nature, it is not we as a person who recognize our true nature. That would be like King Lear having the experience, I am John Smith. King Lear cannot have the experience, I am John Smith, because he is a limitation of John Smith. Isn't it possible for King Lear to recognize his nature, his no, true nature? it's through not his possible for King Lear to recognize his true nature, period. Only John Smith has the experience, I am John Smith. So somebody... Where are you? Ask me at lunch. Are you enlightened? So I said I would postpone um, answering your question until this afternoon because it's a very interesting question and actually you were going to ask the question but you don't need to because, because it, this conversation leads into it. No person is ever enlightened. That would be like saying King Lear has the recognition I am John Smith or or, or Julius Caesar has the recognition, I am John Smith. No, it is always only John Smith who knows, I am John Smith. But supposing, there's an, supposing the heart has a different, has a different um, way of being... The heart is the a poetic the, name the for John Smith. The heart so is... What, is but what, it, I, it, what it, I'm it, saying, sorry to argue with you. No, no, really just please do, I, I'm <laughs> thoroughly enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> So I've, I, real, I recognize that when I am not thinking or, f or when I'm through meditation or whatever process it is, through deep relaxation, quietude, I recognize that the, the sense of the heart opening. And when the heart opens, and the heart, when it opens, can know 
I'm sure it can't be, it can know John Smith, but because it knows in a different way than the mind, completely different you, way, because it you, knows you're, silently. You're right. If, if, using your language, we call the mind yeah. King Lear, and if we call the heart John Smith, then you're quite right. The mind, King Lear, cannot know John Smith. Only the heart, John Smith, That's can it. know John Smith. So it's, you, you're, using, you're using language in a slightly different way. It's fine. So the mind represents the, the, the limited person, and the heart is a poetic image for our essential nature. Why? Because our heart is that which is innermost. So the heart, in, in traditional language, is a metaphor for our essential self. Yeah. In, Sufi t t t Sufi language, in Sufi language. In Sufi, in, in, in the Vedantic tradition, in, in the yeah. Christian tradition, in, in some. So can the personality, this is King Lear, can the character be affected by this recognition? Absolutely, yes. Yes, a character, that is the, the body and the mind of each of us, can and is profoundly impacted by this recognition. Previously, most of our characters um, entertained thoughts and feelings and engaged in activities and relationships on behalf of the felt sense of separation. Now, after this self-recognition, we engage in thoughts and feelings and activities and relationships, but on behalf of our true self. So the, we, the same character is now used in the service of love and understanding, whereas previously it was used in the service of the neuroses, the fears, the anxieties, the insecurities of the separate self. So the movement, the movement is from inward. If the movement is after recognition, when one has unveiled that recognition of one's true nature, that means that the, the, the self, the personal self, can actually become a servant exactly. of that. Exactly, exactly. So it, th there are two movements, as you rightly imply. There's, there's what I refer to as the inward-facing path. That is the path that King Lear takes as he's tracing his way back to his true nature. This is the path of meditation or prayer. We, we turn away from the content of experience. I'm not my thoughts I am that which is aware of my thoughts. I'm not my feelings and sensations. I'm that which is aware of feelings and sensations. I'm not my perceptions. I'm that which is aware of my perceptions. It's, it's the neti-neti approach, tracing our way back deeper and deeper and deeper, deeper until we arrive at that irreducible, essential element of ourself, pure consciousness or pure being. That's the inward-facing part. But then the the outwards, the via negativa in the Western tradition, but then the via positiva. We go outwards again, and we gradually align our thoughts, feelings, activities, and relationships with this new understanding. So yes, there, there, are, two, there are two pathways. So the self can become a servant of the heart? The, the character. Yes. Let's keep the word self... For, for, for the self. But yeah, you, you mean the character. Absolutely. The character can become a servant of the heart, can be a servant of love and understanding. Absolutely. Just going back to this, because it's such a... It's such a, a essential understanding, this recognition that, that only, only awareness can know awareness. Only consciousness can know consciousness. That, that the finite mind cannot know the infinite precisely because it is finite. It's, it's for the same reason that we can't see white snow through orange-tinted glasses because the vehicle through which we look confers its limitations on that which we perceive. So with the finite mind, we cannot know who we are. King Lear cannot know John Smith. Our, our essential self knows itself by itself. And our knowledge of our own being is an utterly unique knowledge. That's why it's referred to sometimes as the absolute. It is absolute knowledge. It is the only knowledge there is 
that is not mediated through the finite mind. Every other knowledge and experience takes place through the limitations of the finite mind and appears in accordance with those limitations. That's why when we look at the world, we don't see God's infinite being. It's all there is out there is God's infinite being, but we don't see God's infinite being. Why? Because the vehicle through which we look, namely perception, is limited. It's what William Blake meant when he said, um, every bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delight enclosed by the five senses. Every bird that flies through the sky is not really a physical object. It is an immense world of delight, the awareness of being. But it is clothed by the five senses and appears as a result as a limited object. And this was... Uh, to my knowledge, never more beautifully or accurately expressed than uh, um, the Sufi mystic Balayani, who said, no one sees him, him. No one sees him except himself. No one reaches him except himself. No one knows him except himself. He knows himself by himself, and he reaches himself by means of himself alone. And then he goes on, no one other than he knows him. No prophet, no sage, no teacher, no angel knows him. His prophet is he, his, his, his messenger is he, his word is he. And then he said, he sent himself from himself, through himself, to himself. There is no means or intermediary other than him. There is no difference between the sender that which is sent, and the one to whom it is sent. It's so exquisitely expressed that, that, that God's being can only be known by God's being. There is one experience that we have in which God's knowledge of itself shines in our experience, and that's the knowledge I am. When we, when we are aware of being, awareness of being is the experience that we refer to when we say simply I am before I am is qualified by experience when we are aware of being that is God being aware of itself in us it is not we as an individual who have that experience in the awareness of being we actually cease being individuals so that, that that's why the name I am is said to be the divine name it the name I am is like a portal in the back of the mind through which the individual passes out of time into eternity. It's why the knowledge I am is the most sacred knowledge. I wanted to ask, if I may, for you to speak to what I can only describe as a crazy, noisy world, <laughs> and whether you can speak to, perhaps more specifically, my experience of sadness, really, <laughs> in a world that feels like it's incre increasingly divided, full of conflict, full of judgment, and it, yeah, I suppose staying open-hearted when it feels like there are so many closed hearts around me. Yes. Well, the reason we live in such a crazy, noisy world, as you say, is because uh, as a culture, we have forgotten about the understanding that we are speaking of here. And therefore, the vast majority of people in the world consider themselves to be temporary, finite, separate selves, and they consider everyone else to be the same. And therefore, they feel that when they um, deal with another person, they don't realize that they're dealing with themselves. And that enables them to behave unkindly, unjustly, and so on with another person. And the vast majority of um, humanity's problems can be traced back to that simple overlooking of 
one single fact of experience, namely we share our being. And remember the two things I suggested at the beginning, peace and happiness are the nature of being, that takes care of our inner life. We share our being with everyone and everything, that takes care of everything outside. So uh, it's important that when we observe this, as you do, that we then don't judge those other people. Otherwise we become like them. The reason, well, I've already suggested the reason our world culture is the way it is, is because it is founded on an assumption, the assumption of separation, the assumption that we are all temporary, finite, individual selves. That enables us to think, feel, act, relate in the way that we see all around us. So we may not be able to do, about, to do anything about the way those other people are thinking and behaving, but we can attend to the way we think and we behave. And the first thing would be not to consider those people not to judge them, not to hate them. Otherwise, we're just doing what they are doing. We are just contributing to the craziness that you refer to. There was a beautiful story that the, um, the Dalai Lama told in a recent um, interview I, I heard of his. And he was talking about a, a friend of his, a, um, a Tibetan monk who had um, not escaped Tibet as the Dalai Lama did uh, but had been uh, um, imprisoned by the Chinese in a concentration camp and he was in a concentration camp for 20 years this guy and when he came out uh, the, Shank uh, the um, Dalai Lama was uh, uh, talking with him and he asked him what it was like in the concentration camp he said it was very dangerous and the Dalai Lama said what, what do you mean it was very dangerous and he said, there were several occasions during the 20 years that I was there when I nearly lost my compassion for my guards. That's what he considered to be danger in a concentration camp. That's really powerful, thank you. Hello, my name's Ivan. I'm wondering what the glue is that holds finite consciousness localized to us. So I thought perhaps it had something to do with the body or our experiences, but as you were talking to that beautiful man earlier about his losing his son and indeed uh, my partner and I losing our daughter, we still feel that they exist as some form of entity. They haven't just merged into the greater consciousness. So in our lifetime and beyond, what, what keeps the, what we refer to as finite consciousness localized to us? In the, in the tantric tradition of Kashmir Shaivism, they describe in detail a series of uh, contractions that infinite consciousness goes through as it takes the form of a finite mind. So it doesn't just happen from one step to another. It, it, it's a, it's a, a series of stepping down contractions. And, and this creates a a kind of pathway, a habit in infinite consciousness as, as it um, coalesces, co uh, contracts and coalesces as a finite mind. And then when that, uh, uh, when that finite mind uh, comes to an end, or the, the, the death of the body would be the delocalization or the decontraction of this finite mind where, where it 
slowly unravels. It takes the same pathway back in the opposite direction. But you're quite right to um, imply that this, this relaxation of the finite mind, of the self-contraction, doesn't go back immediately to, to, to the totally uncontracted state. It, it unravels gradually and expands back into the unlocalized consciousness in the same way that um, a, a, a whirlpool in a river it, it, the energies that are present in the river gradually coalesce and converge and form a whirlpool which all there is to the whirlpool is the the totality of the river, but nevertheless it is a, a localization of the river, made only of the river, but nevertheless a localization of it. The, the whirlpool in this case would represent the individual. When the whirlpool disbands, it, it, it's, it loses its integrity, it expands back out into the river, but it doesn't just go one moment, it doesn't come to an end in a moment, that, that, that the integrity of the whirlpool gradually relaxes and expands and dissipates into the river. And this would be a, um, a, a crude analogy of what may, may take place when an individual dies, that the, this localization of infinite consciousness that is each of us begins to unwind, delocalize, expand back into the whole, but may not go all the way back. There's nothing to suggest that the um, energies that are left over from the disbanding whirlpool may not gather together again and form the basis of another whirlpool downstream. So what I'm suggesting would be realms of experience, realms of mental experience that exist after the death of the body from this point of view, what we view as the body would be what our individual minds look like f from a localized perspective. So when you experience yourself, you experience a bundle of thinking and feeling. When I look at you, I don't see a bundle of thinking and feeling. I see a body. But your body is the extrinsic appearance of your intrinsic experience of mind. So when the body, when, when what appears from the outside to be the death of the body would be an unraveling of the finite mind, a return of the finite mind to the infinite. But it doesn't happen immediately. And this would account, I would suggest, for your feeling that, that your daughter is somehow still present, not just as your own being, which she essentially is, but she could also exist in some intermediary form. Mm. This is speculative, mm. but it's a, a model of uh, life and the afterlife and possibly reincarnation that is consistent with this consciousness-only model. Mm. And can I ask, does the coalescing originally, does that happen before taking a body or after? Well, remember that the body is the image of that coalescing. So it's not that one happens before the other. They are just two different views of the same thing. Okay, yeah. The appearance of the body would be the, yeah. it, it, what yeah. this coalescing looks like from the outside. And, and a newborn infant has no idea that it is a body. What does a newborn infant experience? Per perceiving. No thinking. Uh, feeling, sensing, and perceiving. The newborn infant has no idea that it is a person, that it is an infant, that it has been born, that it is in a world. It's just a bundle of experiencing, a bundle of perceiving. What do we see when we look at the newborn infant? Do we see a bundle of perceiving? No, we see a little body. It's the, the, mind, the, the, in, the infant experiences itself from the inside as mind. We perceive it on the outside as body. But the mind and the body are not two different things. They are two different views of the same thing. That's why there's such a close correlation between the mind and the body. It's because they're the same thing.
They're not even two closely related things. They are the same thing. Likewise, if our bodies are what our individual minds look like when perceived from the outside, what does that mean? That, what does that imply that the world is? It means that the world is what the, the activity of God's mind looks like from our localized perspective. What we are looking at is not a world made out of dead, inert stuff called matter. It is literally God's body. We see it as a physical world because we're looking at it from the outside. From the inside, it is not made of stuff called matter. It is made out of stuff called consciousness. It is the activity of consciousness. Remember that beautiful thing William Blake said when he was having a conversation like this with one of his friends, trying to explain to his materialist friend that the universe wasn't made out of dead inert stuff called matter. It was made out of, in religious language, God's being. And, and his, um, his friend said, well, what do you mean to say that when you see the sun rise, you do not see a round disk of fire somewhat like a guinea? And William Blake replies, oh, no, 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 I see an innumerable company of the heavenly host crying, glory, glory, glory is the Lord God Almighty. That, 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 that's why we have artists in our culture. It is to give us a vision of, 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 of reality. It is to, it, it, uh, uh, the work of an artist is, is, to, is to penetrate through appearances. The only reason the world appears to us in the way that it does is because our senses are configured in the way that they are. If our senses were configured in a different way, the world would appear to us in a different way. What we're seeing is that the way our senses render reality, but what is reality itself before it is rendered by our senses? It's the activity of God's mind. That's the world that an artist tries to, to show us. Thank you very much.